Still standing in the first edition. And the next book will be... Beggar Prince, I've read that one already. Cleansing of the Fane. Might even be a skill book. Because it is worth 50 gold. It added a map marker. Alright, I'll take that as well. The Chronicles of the Holy Brothers of Maruk, Volume 4. Or The Cleansing of the Fane. And the same applies for this book. Um, it says it might have at least three other volumes, but since it has its own title, I uh, will start reading anyway. So let's go. Editors note that this is the only surviving fragment of the Chronicle of the First of this First Era sect of the Alessian Order. It seems to have been kept at their great monastic complex at Lake Canalus, which was raised during the War of Righteousness in the First Era and his archives destroyed or dispersed. Note also that Alessian scribes of this time customarily dated events from the Apotheosis of Alessia. Right. Also in the first era. Here is recorded the events of the year 127 of the blessed Alessia. And this year was the day darkened over all lands and the sun was all as it were master, but three days old and the stars about him at midday. This was on the fifth of first seed. All who saw it were dismayed and said that a great event should come hereafter. So it did, for that same year issued forth a great concourse of devils from the ancient elvish temple Malada. Such had not been seen since the days of King Balarza. These devils greatly afflicted the land such that no man could plow or reap or seed, and the people appealed to the brothers of Maruk for succor. What does it mean, succor? like soccer. And then Abbot Cosmas gathered all the brothers and led them to Malada, also known as the High Fane in the Elvish tongue, and came against it with holy fire, and the foul demons were destroyed, and many devilish relics and books found therein were burned, and the land had peace for many years. And that's it. Weird book. Although it added a map marker, so maybe it's related to whatever is marked. What marker? This one. This must be it. Malada. Okay, so it's like in... Uh, what is it? It's a ruin. An Alade ruin. Wait, let's check it one more time. Where is it mentioned? Malada is the high fane in the elvish tongue. Ooh, there should be an interesting uh, dungeon then. For whenever I get there. Alright. Gods and worship. I know that book. Darkest Darkness. I haven't read that one yet. Let's go ahead. No editor? All right. In Morrowind, both worshippers and sorcerers summon lesser Daedra and bound Daedra as servants and instruments. Most Daedric servants can be summoned by sorcerers only for very brief periods, within the most fragile and tenuous frameworks of command and binding. This fortunately limits their capacity for mischief, though in only a few minutes most of these servants can do terribly terrible harm to their summoners as well as their enemies. Worshippers may bind other Daedric servants to this plane, through rituals and pacts, such arrangements result in the Daedric Servant remaining on this plane indefinitely, or at least until their bodily manifestations on this plane are destroyed, precipitating their supernatural essences back to oblivion. Whenever Daedra are encountered at Daedric ruins or in tombs, they are almost invariably long-term visitors to our plane. Likewise, lesser entities bound by their Daedra lords into weapons and armor may be summoned for brief periods or may persist indefinitely, so long as they are not destroyed and banished. The class of bound weapons and bound armors, summoned by temple followers and conjurers, are examples of short-term bindings. Daedric artifacts like Maroon's razor and the Mask of Clefica's vials, vial, are examples of long-term bindings. Maroon's razor, that's DLC. The Tribunal Temple of Morrowind has incorporated the veneration of Daedra as lesser spirits subservient to the immortal Elm Sivi, 
the triune godhead of Almalexia, Sothasil, and Vivek. These subordinate daedra are divided into the good daedra and the bad daedra. The good daedra have willingly submitted to the authority of Elm Sivi. The bad daedra are rebels who defy Elm Sivi, treacherous kin who are more often adversaries than allies. The good daedra are Bothia, Azura, and Mephala. The hunger is a powerful and violent lesser daedra associated with Bothia, father of plots, a sinuous, long-limbed, long-tailed creature with the beast's scald head, noted for its paralyzing touch and its ability to disintegrate weapons and armor. The winged twilight is a messenger of Azura, goddess of dusk and dawn. Winged twilights resemble the feral harpies of the west. Though the feminine aspects of the winged twilights are more ravishing and their long sharp hooked tails are immeasurably more deadly. Spider daedra are the servants of Mephala, taking the form of spider humanoid centaurs with a naked upper head, torso and arms of human proportions mounted on the eight legs and armored carapace of a giant spider. Unfortunately, these daedra are so fierce and irrational that they cannot be trusted to heed the commands of the spinner. As a consequence, few sorcerers are willing to either summon or bind such creatures in Morrowind. The bad daedra are Maroon's Dagon, Malekath, Sheogoreth, and Moloch Ball. Three lesser daedra are associated with Maroon's Dagon. The agile and pesky Scam, the ferocious and beast-like Clenfear, and the noble and deadly Dremora. The crocodile-headed humanoid daedra called the Daedroth as a servant of Molech Ball, while the giant but dim-witted Ogrim is a servant of Malekath. Shiogoras Lesser Daedra, the Golden Saint, a half-clothed human female in appearance, is highly resistant to magic and a dangerous spellcaster. Another type of Lesser Daedra often encountered in Morrowind is the Atronach, or Elemental Daedra. Atronachs have no binding kinship or alignments with the Daedra Lords. Serving one realm or another at whim, shifting sides according to seduction, compulsion, or opportunity. So I guess this book explained um, the um, Daedra enemies you can find in this game as well. I did not know they're connected to um, a particular Daedra Lord though. Silver Urn? That's nothing we can read. The Book of Daedra, we have read that. That's the same biography of Berenzia. Also, the refugees. I haven't read that one yet. It's a skill book, light armor. The refugees by Garros Albrey. The smell of the bay oozed through the stones of the cellar, salt and briny decay. The cellar itself had its own scents of old wine turned to vinegar, mildew, and the more exotic spices of herbs the healers had brought with them to tend the wounded. There were more than 50 people squeezed into the big earthen room, which had once been forgotten storage for the brothel above. The groaning and whimpering had ceased for now, and all was still as if the hospital had turned into a mass grave. Mother, a red guard boy whispered, what was that? The boy's mother was about to answer him when, when there was another rolling roar from outside, which grew louder and louder as if some great but incorporeal beast had come into the cellar. The walls trembled and dust burst from the ceiling in a rain of powder. Unlike the last time, no one screamed. They waited until the weird haunting sound had passed and then was replaced by the soft rumble of the distant battle. A wounded soldier began whispering Mara's prayer for the doomed. Mankar, a Bosmer woman curled up in a cot, hissed, her eyes feverish, flesh white and wet with sweat, he is coming. Who is coming? asked the boy grasping his mother's skirt tight. Winter. No, he didn't say that. Who do you think, lad? The Swede's monger? A grizzled one-armed red guard growled. The Camoran usurper. The boy's mother shot an angry look at the old warrior. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's sick. The boy nodded. His mother was usually right. He had not yet even been born when people began whispering that the Camoran usurper was coming towards her little village and she had packed up their belongings to flee. Their neighbors had laughed at her, she said, saying that Rihad and Teneth would handily defeat him. Her husband Lucar's father, who he was never to meet, had also laughed at her. It was the harvest time and she would miss out on the celebrations. But this mother, Mayak One or Mayak I, was right. Two weeks after she fled the village, she heard the tale that it had been obliterated during the night with no survivors. Rihad and Teneth had both fallen. 
the usurper was unstoppable. Lucar had been born and grown up in refugee camps throughout Hammerfell. He had never known a friend for more than a few days. He knew that when the sky burned red to the west, they would peck and move east. When it burned in the south, they moved north. At last, after twelve years of moving from camp to camp, they had taken passage across the Iliac Bay to the province of High Rock and the barony of Dwinden. There, Mayak I had promised and hoped that they would have a peaceful permanent home. It was so green there, it blinded him, unlike Hammerfell, which was only green in certain seasons and in certain places. Dwinden was verdant year-round, until wintertide when it began to snow and Lucar had been frightened of it at first. He was ashamed to think of it now when there was real danger, but the red clouds of war, the stink and pain of the refugee camp, that was familiar. Now the red sky was on the horizon of the bay and coming closer, and he longed for the days when a scattering of white made him cry. Mankar, the Bosmer woman cried out again, he is coming and he will bring death. No one is coming, said a pretty young Breton healer, coming to the woman's side. Hush now. Hello, came a voice from above. The whole room, almost together as one gasped. A Bosmer limped down the shoddy wooden stairs, his friendly face very obviously not that of the Comoran usurper. Sorry if I frightened you, he said. I was told there were healers here and I could use a little help. Haha, maybe it's a trap, maybe it's the usurper. Rosena hurried to take a look at the Bosmer's wounds on his leg and chest. Disheveled, but chill, still beautiful, she was one of the favorites at the brothel, who had learned her healing skill along with her more vocational skills at the house of the Bella. She carefully but quickly pulled the rent leather cuirass, chausses, tests his greaves and boots off him, and placed them to the side while she examined the injuries. The old redguard warrior picked them up and studied them. You were in the war? Next to it is probably a better way to put it, the Bosmer smiled, wincing slightly at Rosena's touch. Behind it, beside it, in front of it. My name's Orban Elmlock. I'm a scout. I try to avoid the real battle so I can get back and report what I see. A good job for people who don't like the color of their own blood very much. Hazim, said the warrior, shaking Orban's hand. I can't fight anymore, but I can fix up this armor if you're going to return. You're a leathersmith? No, just a jack of all trades, replied Hazim, opening up a small canister of wax to prep the hard but flexible leather. I could tell you were a scout from the armor, though. Can you tell us what you've been spying on? We've been down in here for half a day now, with no word from the outside. The entire Iliac Bay is one great battlefield on the waves, said Orban, and sighed as Rosena's spell began to close his jacket but shallow wounds. We've shot off the invasion from the mouth of the bay, but I was coming from the coast, and the enemy's army is marching over the Rothgarian mountains. That's where I had my little scuffle. It's not too surprising moving the flank in from the side while the front battle is occupied. It's a play right out of Comoran Kelto's book of tricks he Hard King borrowed. The Hard King? Lucar asked. He had been listening quietly, understanding everything except that. Haman Comoran, the Comoran usurper, Haman Hard King, they're all the same lad. He's a complicated fellow and needs more than one name. You know him? Mike I asked, stepping forward. Near on twenty years before this whole black bloody business, I was Camorran Kelto's chief scout and Haman was his sorcerer and advisor. I helped them both, when they were vying for the Camorran throne and began the conquest of- Ouch! Rosena has ceased her healing. With eyes of fury, she had reversed her spell and the closed, mended wounds were opening again, dark infections returning. She held them with surprising strength when Orban tried to pull back. Something he said was wrong? You bastard, the healer courtesan hissed. I have a cousin in Felanesti, a priestess. She's fine, Orban yelped. Lord Keltos was very adamant about not harming anyone who did not pose a threat. I think the people of Quach would disagree with him with that assessment, said Hazim coldly. That was horrible, the worst thing I've ever seen. Orban nodded. Keltos wept when he saw what Haman had done. My master did everything he could to stop it, begging the Hard King to return to Valenwood. But he turned on Keltos and we fled. We are not your enemy, and we have never been. Keltos could do nothing to prevent the horror that the usurper has brought to the Colovian West and Hammerfell, and he has fought for fifteen years to prevent more. The frightening bestial roar passed through the cellar again, even louder than before. The wounded could not help groaning in helpless terror. And what is that? Mayak I sneered. 
another of Kamor and Kaltos' tricks that the usurper picked up? It is indeed a trick, as a matter of fact, Orban yelled above the screech. It's a phantasm he employs to scare people. He had to use fear tactics in the beginning when his power was ascending, and he has to, has, and he has to fall back on them now for his power is waning. That is why it took him two years to conquer Valenwood and another thirteen to half conquer Hammerfell. No offense to you Red Guards, but it isn't only your battle prowess that has been holding him back. He does not have the support he used to have from his master. The echoing roar increased in intensity before once again falling silent. Mankar. The Bosman woman groaned. He comes and he will destroy all. His master? asked Lucar. But Orban's eyes had gone to the Bosman woman, curled up in her blood-soaked cot. Who is she? Orban asked Rosena. Kind of keeping lost of the track of all the characters here, but I'll try to pick up. All right, let's continue. One of the refugees, of course, from your friendly little war in Vellenwood before you and your Keltos changed side. Sides, the healer replied. I think her name is Kalis. Kalisi. By Jeffer, Orban whispered under his breath, limping over to the woman's cot and wiping the sweat and blood streaked hair from her pallid face. Kalise, it's Orban, do you remember me? How did you get here? Did he hurt you? Mankar, Kalise moaned. That's all she says, said Rosena. I don't know what that is, Orban frowned. Not the usurper though, she knew him too. Very well, she was a favorite of his. His favorite's you, Keltos. Her all seemed to turn against him, said Mayak I. That is why he will fall, replied Hazim. Armored footfall rang along the ceiling, and the cellar door burst open. It was the captain of Baron Othrox Castle Guards. The docks are on fire. If you want to live, you'll need to take refuge at Castle Whitemore. We need help, Rosena called back, but she knew that the guards were needed for defense, not to help carry the sick to safety. With ten guards who could be spared and the most able-bodied of the wounded assisting, the cellar was emptied as the streets of Dwinan filled with smoke and fire begin, began to spread through the chaos. It had been a single fireball of miscast out at sea striking the docks, but the damage would be tremendous. Some hours later, in the courtyard of the mighty castle, the healers were able to set up the cots and begin to tend once again to the suffering of the innocent. The first person Rosena found was or Orban Elmok. Even with his wounds reopened, he had helped carry two of the patients into the castle. I'm sorry, she said, as she pressed her healing hands into his wounds. I lost my temper. I forgot that I am a healer. Where is Kalise? Orban asked. She's not here? Rosena said, looking around. She must have run away. Run away? But wasn't she injured? It was not a healthy situation, but new mothers can surprise you with what they can do when it's all over. She was pregnant? Orban gasped. Yes, it wasn't such a difficult birth in the end. She was holding the boy in her arms when I saw her last. She said she had done it herself. She was pregnant, Orban murmured again. The mistress of the Comoran usurper was pregnant. Word quickly spread throughout the castle that the battle was over, and more than that, the war was over. Haman and Comoran's forces had been defeated at sea, and in the mountains the Hard King was dead. Lucar watched down from the battlements into the dark woods that surrounded Dwinan. He had heard about Kalis, and he imagined a desperate woman fleeing with her newborn baby in her arms into the wilderness. Kalis would have nowhere to go, no one to protect them. She and her baby would be a refugee, like Mayak I and him had been. Reflecting back, he remembered her words. He is coming, he is coming, and he will bring death, he will destroy all. Lucar remembered her eyes. She was sick, but not afraid. Who was this he who was coming if the Camoran usurper was dead? Did she say nothing else? asked Orban. She told me that the baby's name. She told me the baby's name, Rosena replied. Mankar. Yeah, maybe I didn't pay attention enough while reading this, uh, but I'm at a loss here <laughs> with all the characters. There must be a clue at the end. Um, the baby's name is Mankar. I don't know, I hope you figured it out. <laughs> While I read it, it was kind of difficult to follow. Um, but I guess they were tricked by the Komoran usurper in the end. And there was something about his mistress. Anyway, I've read it and it counts for something.
It was a nice tale, though. Very well written. Alright, let's uh, go to the next book.